Hello everyone, welcome to Advancing Adventism. Now if you're an SCA, you'd probably agree that heaven is a place, but you might be surprised to learn what early SCAs used to teach regarding heaven's physicality and how this relates to some of our most important pillar doctrines. So here's what we're going to be doing in this video. We're going to start by covering a section from the second part to William Ingram's article, the part where he covers his second premise that heaven is a location. And then we're going to look at some statements by a couple of other early pioneers that address heaven's physicality. And by the end of this video, you should walk away with a very clear understanding of how we can know heaven is a place and how heaven's physicality relates to fundamental truths like the nature of man, the nature of angels, the personality of Christ, the personality of God, and even the nature of reality itself. Now, before just jumping right into the quotes, there's something I'd like to briefly share with you that we've covered in more detail in previous videos, but it's an important thing to, uh, to mention. So when it comes to the pillars of our faith, Ellen White promoted the writings of the early pioneers who were confirmed in our faith. Now, in uh, the last video where we covered the first part of Ingram's article, we saw that Ingram was mentioned in particular as someone who was confirmed in the faith. In this letter, James White relates that on a Monday morning at a prayer meeting, Ellen White was given a vision, and in that vision, God showed her that Ingram was someone who must feed the sheep. Of course, William Ingram wasn't the only pioneer who was confirmed in the faith. There were certainly others. And this is another video that we have on our channel right now where um, we cover why Ellen White endorsed the writings of the early pioneers, particularly on the pillars of our faith. So um, you can find the link in the description for that and, and links to everything that we're covering, of course. Okay, now with that said, uh, here's where we're going to be picking up with Ingram's article. Now, we've already covered the first part, like I mentioned already. We, we covered it in detail in the previous video on this channel. And um, so I'm going to, though, I'm going to give a brief recap so that everyone can track with me and it'll be fresh in your mind. Or if you haven't seen the first video, you'll be able to still follow what we're saying in this video. Okay, so by this point in Ingram's article, he had just finished providing evidence to prove his first proposition that God is a personal being. So if we just kind of swoop up to the top of the article there, we can see that um, there's two propositions that he intends to cover in this article. The first one is that God is a being. Well, that's how he has it in his title, but then he restates that as his first proposition being God is a personal being. Okay, then he starts a little preamble where he mentions how most Christians uh, think that God is immaterial and that heaven is beyond the bounds of time and space. Of course, beyond the bounds of time and space is just another way of referring to non-physicality or immateriality. Okay, so Ingram links these two issues, God and heaven, because the nature of, of God and his dwelling place uh, must in some way match. One necessarily implies something about the other. So um, we'll see more about that here directly in just a moment. But then Ingram goes on to cover his first proposition, and here he states it as God is a real person. Now, in the previous video, we uh, addressed the aspect of real versus imaginary and all that, but there's another point I'd like to be sure that you're taking note of at this stage. Um, you know, we saw that Ingram's article is titled God a Being and Heaven a Place, but then he phrases his first proposition um, as God is a personal being. And here we see that he says God is a real person, but those are all referring to the same thing. He's using the words being and person synonymously. Uh, you see, while most Christians would make a distinction between what a person is and what a being is, um, in particular when it comes to talking about God, early SDAs didn't make any sort of distinction like that between being a person and being a being. For all early SDAs, um, if you're a person, you are a being. And this article is just a really good example of how early SDAs held that view. So he's proving or he's setting out to prove that God is a being 
In other words, God is a personal being. In other words, God is a real person. Okay, so once he gets into proving his first proposition, um, the scriptures that he provides are all dealing with the uh, focus of showing that God has a physical form, a bodily form. He repeatedly points to the materiality of God as his evidence to prove that God is a personal being. And he points to scriptures that uh, mention that God has a face, has hands, has back parts, has feet, and um, also scriptures that say that, you know, that God has actually been seen. So not just that he's capable of being seen. We have uh, in scripture, we have witnesses saying that they have actually seen parts of God's body, you know, not his face, but parts of the rest of his body. Now, um, Ingram, later on in the article, he points out that the scriptures say that Christ is in the form of God. And Ingram says, well, this proves that God has a form. And he also equates an immaterial being with a non-entity. In other words, an immaterial being doesn't exist. A non-entity is a non-existent something, you know. Um, Now, the reason he equated an immaterial being with a non-entity is because he rejected the notion that immateriality exists at all, right? Um, All early SDAs held to this position. This has to do with what they believed about the nature of reality. Um, Now, we'll be seeing more about this as we continue. So his whole first point is that God is a physical you know, material bodily being, and um, that this fact of him being bodily and occupying space and time, this is what proves his personhood or it proves his personality. And that's just another word for referring to personhood. Um, Personality in this context doesn't refer to character traits. It, It refers to what does it mean to be a person? Okay. So he says it's the physicality of God that proves that he is a personal being. And then he sums up the first part of his article by saying, if we have proved our first point, the second is easily reached. If God is a personal being, he must have a fixed habitation. Okay, now this is what I was referring to earlier when I said that um, Ingram links the personality of God to the physicality of heaven um, because God's personality or his personhood has a direct implication on what his dwelling place must be like. Okay, here's his reasoning, all right? A personal being is a material being. Whatever is material occupies space. To occupy space is to have a place, right? Um, A location, Uh, since place is the space that a thing occupies, okay? Now, that's why if God is a personal being, he must have a fixed habitation, okay? That was his reasoning. Now, it's important to realize just how very different Ingram's reasoning is from that of mainstream Christianity. This demonstrates a major difference in the way early SDAs understood what it means to be a person as compared to what the rest of Christianity Uh, typically understands what it means to be a person. Ingram says that a personal being must have a fixed habitation, which shows that he did not believe that a personal being has a non-physical part to themselves that can exist independent of the body. Okay. Now, if he thought a person has an immaterial part to themselves, he couldn't make this statement. Immateriality is supposed to be beyond the bounds of time and space. So that would mean it doesn't have to have a fixed habitation, okay? So if a material being has an immaterial part to their person, they wouldn't be confined to a bodily existence. Their immaterial part could extend beyond their body because, again, immateriality isn't bound by time or space, So all this applies to how Ingram is uh, understanding what it means to be a person in general, but also specifically in regard to what it means for God to be a person, you know, regarding the personality of God. 
In other words, not only does he reject the idea that God is bodiless, but his arguments also discredit the idea that God is a dualistic being with a body plus some immaterial part that can extend beyond his body. So now that we've gone over, you know, a review of the first part of Ingram's article and saw what he meant by a personal being, we can now pick up where we left off in our previous video. He says, we are now prepared to consider our next proposition, heaven is a location. Okay, so now he's about to get into some of the evidence for the materiality of heaven. And I'll be reading the green part. He says, in arguing this point, we might call up the question of the resurrection of the saints and show that they will have material bodies composed of flesh and bones like the glorious body of Christ. And also that angels are real beings, tangible and material. These principles involve the idea that heaven must be a location. Okay. So he's already connected heaven's physicality to the personality of God. We saw that in the first part, and that's, you know, one of our most important pillar doctrines. And here we can see he's connecting uh, heaven's physicality also to the nature of man, even after we've received our glorified bodies, okay, after the resurrection and all that. So he connects heaven's physicality to our pillar doctrine of the personality of Christ as well. Uh, we're going to have material bodies like Christ's glorious body, okay? And he connects heaven's physicality to the nature of angels. He says angels are real beings, you know, real versus imaginary, right? They're real beings. And what he means by that is they're tangible and material. So that gets into the nature of angels. He's connecting that to the... Uh, heaven's physicality, the bodily existence of mankind, Christ, and angels, these very principles of material beings occupying space in heaven are what involve the idea that heaven must be a location. Okay, now then he says, evidences growing out of the bare facts we pass over and offer proof from another source. So what we've just seen is what he's referring to as the bare facts. Um, the occupants of heaven are unitary physical beings. Uh, this means they must occupy, you know, a real physical place. So that's just like a bare fact. But now he's going to pass from these points. He's going to see what the scriptures have to say about heaven. Okay. So then he goes through and he lists a whole bunch of uh, various scriptures. And these passages of scripture use directional language when referring to heaven. These are words like, you know, from, uh, down from heaven, in heaven, away from the shepherds, you know, into heaven, and the whole to and from. Those, those terms give directionality, like they specify a point, right? Now, then if you look at the yellow, uh, then Ingram asks, after citing a few of the scriptures that refer to heaven with that directional language, he says, how could such language be applied to a heaven beyond the bounds of time and space? Right now, his point here, of course, is that it can't, right? It can't be applied to a heaven beyond the bounds of time and space because there is no locality beyond the bounds of time and space. That inherently means there's no location in time. There's no location in space. It's beyond time and space, okay? So there's no to or from, no in or out or, you know, away from something that would be non-physical. Uh, that type of language, to and from, away from, and all that specifies location, okay? It indicates locality. But, you know... Here we see in the scriptures that directional language being applied to heaven, and thus it refers to heaven's physicality. Again, only physicality has location. Immateriality has no location. Okay, now here are some more passages that Ingram um, quotes, and they're using directional language. And then he quotes Jesus' words in John chapter 14, where he tells his disciples, and we'll just move that up to the top, 
He tells his disciples, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, etc., etc., right? But there it just flat out says it's a place, right? This is plain language from Jesus himself that paradise is a place. It has location. And since only materiality has location, it's, you know, just straightforward testimony from Jesus that God dwells in a physical location. Okay, now we're going to look at um, a very short article, and we won't even cover the whole thing, but we're going to look at a short article from an early pioneer named Etta Booth, and I couldn't find any picture of her, any photograph of what she looks like. But anyway, um, her article is titled Heaven, a Location, and uh, she quotes a couple of scripture passages that portray heaven as a location by using, the, you know, the language that indicates location or directionality. Um, we just saw some of that from Ingram, of course. Now, here again, you know, directionality is something that can only be applied to something physical. Immateriality doesn't have directionality. So let's read these scriptures and then we'll see what Etta had to say about them. She quotes from Acts 3, and it says, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And then she quotes from Acts 1, and that reads, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which was taken up to you, or which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Okay, so then Etta Booth writes, If it be established that the incarnation of Christ was local, that his crucifixion was local, and that his resurrected body was real, tangible, and local as the bodies of other men, then it is also established that heaven, the heaven of heavens, the home of ministering spirits, the mansions preparing for the just, has and all have a locality somewhere in the boundless creation of space. Now I'm going to continue on in just a moment, but um, just real quick, let's just think about that for a moment. Clearly, Etta Booth's point that she's making is that Christ was localized on earth. He was here as a man, just like all other men. And he had uh, a local position on the earth while he was here. He was crucified in a particular place. His crucifixion was local. And even when he rose from the dead, he rose from the dead bodily. The disciples touched him. He was tangible, material, and local. He was right there. When when he wasn't there, he, you know, he wasn't there. <laughs> he was somewhere else. So anyway, she says, well, then, you know, it's established also that heaven, which is, you know, also the home of ministering spirits. So that's a reference to the nature of angels. You know, Hebrews tells us that the angels are ministering spirits. And, you know, there's mansions that are being prepared there for the just. So heaven uh, has a locality somewhere in the boundless creation of space. And all of these beings have a locality somewhere in the boundless creation of space, right? It's out there somewhere. We don't know where, but it's somewhere. So it has location. So she's connecting the physicality of heaven to the personality of Christ, the nature of man, and the nature of angels. And then she she goes on to write, um, Moses heralded the Messiah to the Jews. Now, this is 
uh, from Acts 3 that we read. You can't see it on the screen anymore, but she's referring back to that passage. She says, um, Moses heralded the Messiah to the Jews. He was to be like himself, a man. So I color coded those in this particular instance to try to make it easier to, to track with pronouns. Sometimes it can be really hard to make sure like, okay, where's the pronoun referring to? Who's it referring to? But it's quite clear that um, she's saying that Moses heralded the Messiah and the Messiah was to be like Moses, a man, right? Because we can see that from Acts chapter three. So Jesus was to be like Moses. He was to be a man. And then she explains a little bit more what she means about that local, capable of being in but one place at a time. Okay, so again, that's um, by referring to the nature of man. She's also referring to the personality of Christ because, you know, Christ became human, right? So that's his personality even still right now. He's still a glorified human. Um, so she says, you know, it, these are all local. They all have locality. So, uh, Moses heralded the Messiah to the Jews. He was to be like himself, a man local capable of being in, but one place at a time and a prophet whose sayings they should hear in all things whatsoever. Then notice what she says. There can be no spiritualizing here. The Holy Bible here is very explicit. And then she quotes from John chapter 14, where Jesus says, again, I go to prepare a place for you. So um, then she says there at the bottom of that paragraph, how beautifully he associates location here with the promise. So here we see Etta Booth connects heaven's physicality to scripture passages that um, use directional language when we referring to heaven, um, even Jesus' own testimony that he's going to prepare a place for his disciples so that they can be with him one day. Then obviously there's the whole, you know, personality of Christ and the nature of man, nature of angels. But look at this part here where she says there can be no spiritualizing here. Okay. This is really important. Early SDAs believed that reality is strictly physical. It's strictly material that Nothing immaterial exists. So, in fact, they refer to any belief in immateriality or non-physicality as spiritualism. Okay. So, when she says there can be no spiritualizing here, she's referring to not portraying heaven or, or man or Jesus or angels or anything, not to describe them as intangible, immaterial, right? Because that would be spiritualizing. Now we've, it's too much to cover, you know, all just right here, but we have other content right now on this channel that explains and provides all the evidence for the fact that um, spiritualism is indeed any belief in immateriality and that this is how early SDAs used the term. It's, it's more broad than just the idea that um, the dead can be in contact with the living. It's far more broad than that. Spiritualism is any belief in immateriality. So we'll have links for you where you can see that. But she, she's just saying here that the scriptures, they don't allow for any spiritualizing. They're not using terminology to refer to heaven or any of these beings um, in non-physical terms, you know. So heaven has to be a physical place because of all these connections to these foundational truths, um, including the nature of reality itself. Okay. So now let's look at our last example. And uh, this is going to be from a pioneer named AC Bordeaux. And we actually have another uh, video on this channel that covers more of his article, a, a great deal more. But from a different angle, it's directly addressing the early SDA use of the word person and its variants. And in that video, I also include quite a bit from Ellen White, you know, um, that parallels what um, AC Bordeaux says in his article. But anyway, so we'll have a video, uh, not a video, we'll have a link to the video for you where you can see that. But anyway, okay. 
So here we're going to start at the top next to the green dot. Um, and we want to be focused again on how AC Bordeaux connects heaven's physicality to some of our most important pillar doctrines. And uh, we'll start with what he says there with, next to the green dot. He says, without having a disposition to dwell to any great length upon the false hopes cherished by many, I will here notice some of the popular sentiments which are received by the mass of professors of Christianity. In doing this, I shall call the attention of the friends to instructions that I, with others, received at a French Baptist educational institute in Canada several years ago. While taking Bible lessons, we were taught by Professor Rue, and then we're going to get to uh, that first point there, okay? Number one, this is what he was taught in the French Baptist Institute, that God is an infinite and eternal spirit without person, body, shape, or parts, is everywhere and nowhere present, or, and then this is about to explain what he just meant by is everywhere and nowhere present, or is everywhere as a spirit and nowhere as a tangible being. So that's what he was taught in the Baptist Institute. But then notice what he asks. I ask, is not this making God almost a mere nothing? Okay, so that's that same language that we saw from Ingram earlier, where he equated an immaterial being with a non-entity. So this portrayal of God as, you know, like everywhere as an intangible spirit, but nowhere as a tangible being is just, isn't that just like making God almost a mere nothing? Doesn't that spiritualize him away and, and make him a non-entity, right? So that has to do with what it means for God to be a person. And, and that's what he was taught um, in the Baptist Institute. So then he goes on and the second point he lists next to the red dot, he says that he was taught that Jesus Christ is God himself, okay? The Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are one identical being. Hence, in describing one, we describe the other. Certainly, this is doing no better by the Son than by the Father. Okay, so... That whole Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are one identical being. That's just straightforward Trinitarianism. And uh, the point he's making here is that um, if we are to say that God has no materiality, right? He's, he's an immaterial, intangible spirit. Well, that makes him a mere nothing. And so if in describing the Father, we're also describing the Son, you know, like he was taught, uh, in the Baptist Institute, well, that's not doing any better by the Son than by the Father because that would also spiritualize away or, or make the Son out to be almost a mere nothing, right? So that's the point he's making there about the personality of Christ. And then he goes on uh, to point number three. He was taught that man enters upon his reward at death. Then the immortal soul, which is the man proper, drops the mortal body and goes directly to heaven or, if unjust, to hell. The just are then like the angels in heaven. So here he's referring to the nature of man and what he was taught. Now, again, you know, these, these are all things that he's referring to as um, false ideas, okay? The false hopes cherished by many, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, here he was taught that the nature of man is such that there's this immortal soul, which is the man proper. Okay, now that terminology, um, that refers to, you know, that's the idea of the soul is what gives us our true identity. That's the man proper. That's who we really are is this immortal or, you know, immaterial, immortal soul that is responsible for our character traits, our cognition, you know, our ability to think and all that. That's attributed by most Christians to the soul, okay? Sometimes people use different terminology than just soul, but uh, sometimes they say spirit too, right? But this is um, referring to a view that he doesn't believe is a true view. Okay, so then... So that has to do with the nature of man. Then he goes on to list what he was taught about the nature of angels. 
Number four, that the angels and the saved in heaven before and after the resurrection are spirits having no person, form, no, nor parts. Their nature is such that nothing can obstruct their way. They can with ease pass through the most dense and the solidest wall in existence and are so constituted that millions of them, millions of the angels and the saved, can be placed on the point of the sharpest needle. Then he says, truly, they must be very delicate, like he's a little tongue-in-cheek there, okay? Um, but then he says, it is wonderful how such beings, question mark, can exist. And that's just an older use of the word wonderful. It, it doesn't mean that's fabulous. That's great. That's so wonderful. <laughs> that's so great. That's not what he means. You can tell that by the context. It's like, um, it's really questionable. It's really uh, not really very believable. It's full of wonder or there's, it's, you know, wonderment. Like, I wonder, like you're not really convinced, right? So clearly he's saying yeah, it's really not believable how such beings can exist. And then notice what he says in the yellow. He says, let us add to this the testimony of Luther Lee. Okay, so first, you know, this first part, he's been relating what he was taught at a French Baptist Institute. So that was the perspective from the French Baptist Institute. But now he's about to add to this the testimony of Luther Lee. And Luther Lee was um, a Methodist, okay? And uh, so then A.C. Bordeaux says he, Luther Lee, describes the immortal soul as follows. Okay, so again, this is the description by someone who believes this about the immortal soul. It is a simple spiritual essence, immortal, immaterial, intangible, indissoluble, having no exterior or interior surface, cannot be extended. And again, this is just the straightforward um, definition of what immateriality is supposed to be. Okay, all these things, like this is accurate. This is from someone who believes this, okay. Having no exterior or interior surface cannot be extended it is analogous to God because, again, you know, even in the Methodist um, creed, they, they say that God has no body or parts either, right? Okay. Um, then he goes on, cannot come in contact with matter and does not occupy space. Okay. Again, just straightforward portrayal of what immateriality is supposed to be. And we might add, does not weigh anything. End quote. So that's the end of Luther Lee's quote about the immortal soul. So then A.C. Bordeaux says, could anyone do any better in trying to define nothing than to give it this description? Now, that's something that's really important to consider, because if you like, like if you just did that, you know, tried to give a definition to nothing or some, some, something that doesn't exist or to non-existence itself. How would you describe that? How would you define what it means to not exist? And his point, A.C. Bordeaux's point, is that you couldn't give nothingness any better description than what we just read from Luther Lee's description of the immaterial or the immortal soul, that it is, you know, all this stuff, including, you know, he uses the word immaterial there. All right. Now, uh, one more thing that we're going to look at now from what he, he was taught at the French Baptist Institute. So number five, he was taught that heaven is a spirit world inhabited by spiritual beings, hence is not a tangible place. Now, just, you know, obviously the word spiritual there is being used in this context to refer to non-physicality. Okay, so heaven is a, a spirit world inhabited by spiritual beings, hence is not a tangible place. That's what he was taught, yet is filled with bliss and joy unspeakable, etc. To this, add the words of the poet, beyond the bounds of time and space, reach forward to that heavenly place, the saints secure abode. 
So it's describing heaven as beyond the bounds of time and space. Okay. Then A.C. Bordeaux says, is this not spiritualizing away God, Christ, angels, saints, and heaven, burning them down to nothing, as it were, by the fire of spiritualism? Okay, now there's that connection again between spiritualism, spiritualizing away, and portraying people or things as non-physical or as immaterial. They refer to this as spiritualism because any belief in immateriality is the same as belief in the non-physical. Belief in, you know, that's what ism stands for, belief. And spiritual in this uh, context is meaning non-physical. Okay, so that's what he was taught at the French Baptist Institute. Now, then he goes on to say, now, many of the texts already quoted and alluded to show that these views are not in accordance with the teachings of the sacred word, though we have seen many professed ministers of the gospel preach them as truths. However, let us briefly examine these points in the light of scriptures. We are clearly shown, okay, so now we've gone through, it's, sometimes it's really helpful to contrast what, um, early SDAs pointed to as false views with what they taught as the true view, as is what they believe to be the true view, because it helps to get a fuller idea of what they really mean when they say, we believe X, Y, or Z. Because if you also know that they reject these other things, it can help keep you on track so that you're not um, reading into it anything that they actually don't intend for you to read into it, okay, to, to not make any unwarranted inferences. So this is about to get into what the scriptures have to say about these topics. So he says, we are clearly shown that God is a material, organized intelligence possessing both body and parts. So he doesn't believe that uh, immateriality is a part of God's existence. He believes that God is material, intelligence, not part material and part immaterial. And then he, he goes through, we're not going to take the time to go through all the, uh, all the points. We're going to skip now to point five, which is parallel to his point five earlier about heaven. Okay. So now we're looking at what he has to say about what the scriptures teach about heaven, but in so doing, he's going to mention some other things too. So it's, it's going to be inclusive enough. He says, uh, this is what the scriptures teach, and this is what we believe as SDAs, that the righteous shall inherit substance, okay? So then he points to Proverbs 8 as scriptural evidence for that, and he says, it is not a heaven beyond the bounds of time and space that they will inherit, for this would be no heaven, okay? There's that whole spiritualizing away again, right? To say that something is immaterial is basically portraying it as non-existent. An immaterial heaven would be no heaven. Okay. Then he goes on picking up in the blue. He says, God sits on a literal throne in heaven and occupies space. So he's just very uh, direct with his statement there. God sits on a literal throne in heaven and occupies space. Angels that excel in strength and that do his commandments are there too. So we've got now angels being brought into the equation. And our Savior at his ascension went to his father's house, the New Jerusalem, which hath foundations in heaven to prepare mansions for his people, etc. Right? So here we see him also bringing in the personality of Christ, our Savior, and that he went to his father's house. And he's going to be preparing mansions. These are all material, physical things that he's pointing to. So in so doing, uh, we see here that A.C. Bordeaux is also connecting heaven's physicality to the personality of God, yes, but also to the personality of Christ, to the nature of man, and to the nature of angels, 
but also just to the nature of reality itself. Because if you're spiritualizing something away, that's showing like it applies to anything, right? Applying immateriality or the idea of being beyond the bounds of time and space to anything, anyone or anything is something that spiritualizes them away. That is what they refer to as spiritualism. And these are the points that he's saying um, would be a false hope and that these are the false hopes cherished by many professors of Christianity. But in contrast, then he gives the early SDA view about heaven's physicality and its connection to our most important pillar doctrines, including the nature of reality itself. All right, so here's what we just covered in a nutshell. We just saw the early SDAs taught that heaven is a physical place, largely because the scriptures straightforwardly describe heaven as material and having location, like just using the word place when referring to God's dwelling. The scriptures also use directional language when referring to heaven, the type of language like to and from and that sort of thing. This type of language can only be applied to a physical place. An immaterial place has no location, right? So using terminology like to and from just in itself straightforwardly indicates that heaven is physical. But in addition to this, they connected heaven's physicality to the nature of man in that the righteous will be taken to heaven and will be resurrected with physical material bodies. So naturally, we're going to need a physical material place to go to. And so heaven naturally would be a physical place. Now, heaven's physicality also connects to the nature of angels in much the same way. Angels are real tangible material beings occupying space. They come and go to and from heaven. So naturally, heaven must be a physical location. It connects to the personality of Christ in that Jesus was resurrected with a tangible material body and he was taken to heaven. So naturally, that would involve the idea that heaven has to be a physical place. And they connected heaven's physicality to the personality of God. God is also a real person. He's tangible, material, he occupies space and time. He's strictly physical, so his dwelling place must naturally be physical. And all of this rests on the very foundational truth of the nature of reality. Early SDAs connected heaven's physicality to the nature of reality in that they understood immateriality to be an impossibility. They rejected the belief in immateriality as spiritualism and said that portraying someone or something as immaterial is spiritualizing them away. In other words, the very nature of reality itself is physical. There is no non-physical existence of any kind. Thus, a non-physical heaven would be no heaven because it wouldn't exist if it was non-physical. Understanding these truths is essential if we want to be sure that we're standing on the eternal platform of truth. So I invite you to come back for our next video. We'll be covering an article, part of an article by James White, wherein he explains heaven's physicality and connects it to some of our pillar doctrines. And we'll also be including in that video uh, some of Ellen White's statements that are saying basically the same thing as what we'll be covering from James White, but it also parallels lots of things said by the other pioneers as well and just demonstrates that she was teaching in harmony with her husband and the other early pioneers regarding heaven's physicality and how it connects to our pillar doctrines. Now, in the meantime, to learn more about these related subjects to the topic we just covered, um, here's some videos that we have on our channel right now where you can learn more about the nature of man, what early SDAs taught about the nature of man, what they taught about spiritualism, what they taught about materialism. So you can check the bio for links to that. We'll put all the links in the bio. With that said, we hope you can see how important this subject is and we hope that you'll 
be eager to share this video with someone that you love and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, many blessings.